Like I said before, we're going to finish up in kind of like the same manner that we started this. So if you turn to John chapter 18, verse 36. Eighteen thirty-six. John chapter eighteen thirty-six. And if you remember, this is the same verse that we started this study with. And those who are able, if you would stand as we read the word. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we come before you today, God, in desperate need of your word, God. We're your sons and your daughters, God, but we can only be that light, and we can only represent you if your word is instilled in our hearts, God. God, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit tonight and strengthen us in your word, God, so that our light can be seen, so your Son, Jesus Christ, can be seen through us, and so the evidence of our life with him would be seen by this world, God. God, allow us to take the basket off our candlesticks so your glory could be seen. And God will give you all the praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> now I'm going to ask you a question. And I already know the answer from a few of you because we've, we've had many discussions about it outside of church. But do you feel more spiritual? Amen. How do you know you feel more spiritual? I know how you know, Brandon and Brian. Maybe you feel, did you feel a little bit more love for people? Have we encountered that where, where love just naturally flowed out? Or maybe we understood a little more. Maybe we seen the big picture. It may be a situation we was in. Maybe a, a situation that would normally scare us. We wasn't frightened because we understood that there was a deeper meaning behind this situation. Or maybe you overcome a sin that you couldn't overcome. Maybe it was a secret sin. Usually the secret sins are a lot harder to overcome because nobody's looking at you. And those are harder to overcome. And they are overcome through much prayer and through much seeking, Jesus Christ. Maybe you did something right in the past little bit. You didn't have to force it. Has that happened to anybody? It's happened to me. I still got room to grow. I had a situation I told you about, but immediately I got mad. It didn't take me long to get over that. But if I'm going to be perfect and spiritually mature, then that anger would have never come. I would have just immediately been spiritual about it. But like this morning, how many was here this morning? When I jumped in Will's lap, him representing God, that's what I had to do when I got angry. I ran and found God and jumped in his lap. If I'd have never got out of his lap to begin with, then I would have never felt that anger. That's our goal. And actually, David, I, I meant to read this verse this morning, but it was in Psalms that where David, his goal in life was to be in the presence of God all the time. And just amazed by his beauty and his glory and, and seeking him. And that's what David did and that's what made him successful. So that's God's goal in our life is it will stick to him. Stay with me. And that's not just because he wants us to be good little puppies. It's because that's what's best for us is if we stay with him. So if you've 
experienced any of these things, more love, you've overcome a sin, you understand a little more, seen the big picture of the situation, then you've successfully achieved starving at the natural man in that area of your life, and you've allowed Christ in you, or the spiritual man, to replace it in that situation. We always have room to grow. There's many other situations in your life that you'll find out that you haven't given to Christ. But Jesus is talking about his kingdom. He said his kingdom ain't of this world. You remember when we talked about this in the beginning? If his kingdom was of this world, then he'd have let Peter continue to swing the sword and they would have won and then he would be still sitting on his throne today in the kingdom from the earth. But so when we starve this natural man out, this is what you actually did. You allowed yourself to step in to the kingdom of heaven, not the manifested kingdom, we're going to go over that in a second, but a mystery kingdom, something that can't be seen with carnal eyes, it's seen through spiritual eyes. And the reason you were allowed to step in it is because you became more spiritual and you could see how to get in it. And it just naturally came. But the two kingdoms, now you can research many studies on this and they'll call it many different things. It don't matter. It don't mean a hill of beans. We're going to look at this in the aspect of two separate kingdoms, but they're the same. And we're going to understand why I meant. They're both the manifested kingdom and what I call the mystery kingdom or the spiritual kingdom, which some people would call you a fool for calling it a spiritual kingdom. I don't know why, but they're in this world, but they're not of this world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. But when he came, John the Baptist uh, proclaimed the kingdom of God was at hand, or the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And it proclaims heaven's rule over earth. So let's look at the manifested kingdom. Does anybody know what that is? It's the kingdom to come. It's the one that the Jews was looking for uh, when they overlooked Christ and him being the Messiah. They wanted somebody to actually come down and do away with evil and sit on a throne and rule, physically rule. Well, we know that hasn't happened yet, but it has happened spiritually to those who accept Christ. We overcome spiritually. So the manifested kingdom is the one to come. It will bring an end to our current age when Christ comes and makes our enemies our footstool and he sits on the throne of David and sin will cease to exist because the tempter will be bound. This is the manifested kingdom. Well today in Zeke's step terms we're going to call what we're in now the mystery kingdom and it begins with Christ's ministry and ends with the harvest. And we know the harvest is the rapture. But if you would let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. <coughs> And there's many, many parables and illustrations of the kingdom in Matthew, but there's two that I want to show you tonight. <coughs> we'll look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that this this is representing the Jews. And I'll tell you how I can tell that right here in just a second. It said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Now this treasure hid in a field, and you can read it in many uh, commentaries. They'll agree with what, what I feel is true is that this is talking about Jews. It's the treasure hid in the field. It, they're not saved yet, but they will be. So Jesus Christ, you know, they're hid in this world. Jesus Christ came and gave his life and he bought this world or give everybody an option to serve him. And the Jews are still hid in this field, this treasure, and they will accept him eventually. And we'll know that'll happen well, some of them have already accepted him, but they will be a big awakening from the Jews during the tribulation period. Now we go on to 45. 
It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, who is this pearl? It's you. It's me. It's the church. This is representing the church. He came and bought us with a price. He bought us with his blood. And what I like about it is it talks about there's one pearl. It doesn't say there's a bunch of pearls. So that means unified. Unified. I think that's beautiful. It represents unity. So that makes you, if you're in here and you're saved, which all of us are, you're a member of the kingdom. You believe that? Now why are you a member of the kingdom? Well, since we're in Matthew, go ahead and flip to Matthew 5, 20. <coughs> 5, 20 says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now the scribes and Pharisees, you all know, they were works based. Even though they didn't even live up to, to their own, to the, to the law. And even their own uh, traditions and religions, they didn't even live up to them, but they held people accountable for them. So you're supposed to be more righteous than the Pharisees and the scribes that looked righteous. They looked the part, played the part, but they weren't righteous. Romans 10.10, 10, you don't have to turn it, I'll read it to you. It says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So for us to be more righteous than the Pharisees and the scribes, then we have to take on the righteousness of Christ because we know our righteousness is this filthy rag. How do we take on the righteous, righteousness of Christ? Through believing. Through believing on His name. And through the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. We all know that. That's common knowledge. When you do that, makes you a part of the kingdom. So we need the righteousness of Christ to enter. Now once we enter the kingdom, the natural man does not does not. So any time that we're rendering to the natural man and what he wants to do and we become carnal, then that pulls us out of what we have just successfully done by becoming more spiritual. And that happens when we're not injecting the word on a regular basis. We can get more spiritual, but the only way that we can hold that ground now I'm not talking about continuing to grow. We can't even maintain that level of spirituality without continuing to inject the Word. If we go a year without studying the Word, some of that can leave us. And we can be begin to see ourselves coming out, or the evidence of the kingdom coming out of our life. Now that doesn't mean you're not saved, and we're going to talk about this right here in just a second. So once we enter the kingdom, the natural part of us doesn't. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We obtain all three of these through faith in who? Jesus Christ. So to enter into this kingdom, to make it into heaven, let alone being a part of this mystery kingdom on earth, it takes Christ in our life. Now we're going to talk about the evidence of those things. And this is where this comes into play, and this is where we get a little deeper into being more spiritual. The more spiritual we become, the more evidence the kingdom is seen in our lives. We'll look at Luke chapter 10. <coughs> 8 and 9, and you don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. It says, And in, into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. So this is Jesus speaking. So when they went out and they're healing the sick, the kingdom of God had come nigh unto them, or the kingdom of heaven had come nigh unto them. So the people that are seeing these healings, this city that they went in, are seeing the evidence of the, of the mystery kingdom in their lives. 
through signs and wonders, through miracles. Luke eleven twenty says, and this is Jesus speaking, said, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. So these are signs that you'll see when the kingdom is working around you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11. Let's turn there and read that. This is the part that gets confusing to some people. And I'm going to explain to you what this means. 1 Corinthians 6. <clears throat> now a lot of your work base churches will use this to make it look like that if you make a mistake, you're going to hell. That is exactly not what this means. Is everybody there? 6 verse 9, 1 Corinthians. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? So what does that mean? That means we need the righteousness of Christ to inherit the kingdom of God, right? That's what the other scripture says. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, or infinite, or whatever that word is, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Have any of you ever been any of those things? Don't raise your hand. You ever been a drunkard? You ever stolen anything? But we know that some Christians have, don't we? I know we're all perfect in here. But some Christians have. Does that mean that they're not going to go to heaven? No, it's talking about the kingdom of heaven's evidence being in their lives. So when we accept Christ, we become a member of the kingdom, but if we act natural, which is what all these things are, fornicating, uh, thieving, drunkenness, revilers, extortioners, all these things are, are products of being natural. We can't inherit the kingdom of God or these signs and wonders can't be done through our lives. How many wants to be able to, for God's glory to be seen through us through signs and wonders. How many wants to heal? How many wants to prophesy? In our next lesson, we're going to get into spiritual gifts. A lot of us don't even know what those are. Do you know what your spiritual gift is? A lot of us don't even know. But that comes hand in hand with becoming more spiritual. The more spiritual we become, the more the evidence of Christ in our life is. The more that Christ is manifest in your life, the less that the natural man is manifest in your life. Therefore, causing the evidence of the kingdom to be seen in your life. Why? Why does that happen? Because we no longer pray for the sick and doubt at the same time. Because we become more spiritual, that means our faith is increased. So when we pray for someone that is sick, there's, not, there's no doubt there anymore. We pray in faith because why? We know that the natural man, his understanding is darkened, right? But when we're spiritual, we have understanding. And we understand that the availability of healing is no longer, is no longer a doubt, but it becomes a reality through faith. So now we pray and believe and we receive and then a miracle happens and then the kingdom of heaven is manifested in your life the same that it was manifested in Christ's life and the disciples life when Peter prayed for someone that was sick what happened they were healed when Jesus said to the dead people get up what happened they got up and that can happen in our lives as a result of injecting the Word on a daily basis and becoming spiritual. But we can only receive that as we receive the Word of God. Too many times we're, we're praying in doubt, not believing, and we know the Word says that a double-minded man ain't going to receive nothing from God. He's unstable in all of his ways. 
That's what the Word says. That's a little harsh, but that's what the Word says. So the injection of the Word goes hand in hand with the evidence of Christ being seen in our life. If you want to live and be a good example, then inject the Word. The more you inject the Word, the more of a good example you are. The more you inject the Word, the more chance that God will use you for miracles. The more you inject the Word, the more chance that you can figure out what your spiritual gift is and that you can use your spiritual gift. Now, a lot of people may want to use their spiritual gift to show off. It's not going to happen. And I can tell you if that's your mindset, you're not spiritual. You're natural minded. You're natural minded. We read about the man that come to the disciples and said, how do I get these powers? He did it uh, wanting to show off. He was wanting to receive that power so he could have that fame and that attention. And we know that he didn't receive that and neither will we. So this only comes through injecting the Word. And as we're injecting the Word, you won't want these gifts out of pride. You'll want them because you understand what your spiritual gift is and you'll want God to be glorified in your life. How many wants that? How many wants God to be glorified in your life? How many believes that if we'll walk the walk and not just talk the talk that more people will come to Christ? How many believes that if we actually prayed and more things happened that more people would come to Christ? How many believes that if we continue to become more spiritual, that we'll make more of a difference? Do we believe that? So next week, Wednesday, we're going to go into spiritual gifts. Maybe you don't know what your spiritual gift is. I know what one of mine is, but I may have more than one. We can only understand that through becoming more spiritual. Maybe you're in here today and you don't know what your spiritual gift is. We all have them. The Word says that we have them. God's plan for us was to glorify Him through us. And we had these gifts. So next week, Lord willing, we're going to learn about spiritual gifts, how to figure out which ones you have, and how to increase your ability to use them. And we all know that that is by injecting the Word of God. Any questions? And this wraps up the kindergarten class. We're going to go into first grade Wednesday. Lord willing. If I'm advanced enough to go to first grade, I guess I'll teach it. Nobody has a question. Y'all want to do circle prayer? Ellie does.